Thank you, Miriam, for being here. Thank all of you for coming out this evening and uh, being here to, for this conversation. Um, I thought we'd start with having you read a little something from mm -hmm. Women Talking. Okay, Before sounds we start good. talking. Yes, thank you. It's so great to be here. Thank you, everybody, for being here. I really appreciate it. In beautiful Southern California. <laughs> Uh, I came here from Winnipeg yesterday, which is, uh, you know, sort of not really my hometown. My hometown is that other place, a uh, small Mennonite town, but, uh, but I've spent most of my life in Winnipeg. But now I live in Toronto. Uh, so, you know, that's, yeah, not everybody's favorite thing. Okay. <laughs> it was minus 15 and minus 20 in Winnipeg and cold, so it's really nice to be here. I'll read a, um, a little bit from Women Talking, and, and um, it's uh, sort of starting not at the very beginning, but a little bit further in. When I arrived in the spring of 2008, there were only whispers, fragments of whispers, concerning the mysterious nighttime disturbances. Cornelius, one of my students, wrote a poem called The Wash Line, in which he described the sheets and garments on his mother's wash line as having voices of speaking with one another of sending messages to other garments and other wash lines. He read the poem to the class, and all the boys laughed. The houses are so far apart, and there is no electrical light anywhere, inside or out. The houses are small tombs at night. On my way back to my shed that afternoon, I saw the wash lines of Malachna. I saw the women's dresses flapping in the wind, and the men's overalls, and the linens, and the bedding, and the towels. I listened carefully, but I couldn't make out what they were saying. Perhaps, I now think, because they weren't talking to me. They were talking to each other. In the year after I arrived, the women described dreams they'd been having, and then eventually, as the pieces fell into place, they came to understand that they were collectively dreaming one dream, and that it wasn't a dream at all. The women in the Friesen and the Lowen families who have gathered for today's meeting represent three generations each, and all have been repeat victims in the attacks. I've done some simple calculations. Between 2005 and 2009, more than 300 girls and women of Malachna were made unconscious and attacked in their own beds. On average, an attack occurred every three or four days. Finally, Liesel Neustater forced herself to stay awake night after night until she caught a young man prying open her bedroom window, holding a jug of belladonna spray in one hand. Liesel and her adult daughter wrestled the man to the ground and tied him up with baler twine. Later that morning, Peters was brought to the house to confront this young man, Gerhard Schellenberg, and Gerhard named the other seven men involved in the attacks. Nearly every female member of the Malachna colony has been violated by, violated by this group of eight, but most, except for the girls too young to understand these proceedings, and the women, led by Scarface Jantz, who have already chosen to exercise the do-nothing option, have marked an X next to their name to indicate that they are content and many ecstatic not to attend the meetings about how to respond. Instead, they will contribute to the well-being of the colony by tending to the chores, which are manifold now while the men are away, and which, if abandoned for as little as one day, will result in mayhem, especially when it comes to the milking and feeding of the animals. The youngest and speediest women in both the Friesen and Lowen families, Aucha and Nietzsche, have agreed to provide the other women in the colony with oral reports at the end of the day when all are back in their houses. Now, in the hayloft of the barn where we have quietly gathered this morning, I wait to do as Ona has asked of me. I'll stop there. Thank you. You're welcome. So, so uh, when I put the Humanities Institute programming for the year together, my main theme was to think about uh, disaster, actually, disaster relief, because the cornerstone of the programming for the year is the 10th anniversary of the Haiti earthquake, which will be this coming January. But then when I put the program together, I thought it's going to be very heavy to ask people to come out you know, every month to events uh, that are only about disaster. And so I decided that the fall needed to be about communities that have fought against disaster, whether that's natural disaster, historical disaster, you know, whatever that may be. And we had met, I had uh, been at the launch of Women Talking in Winnipeg. And for those of you who don't know, 
uh, I'm originally from the Caribbean, from Haiti, but I grew up in, Win in Winnipeg. Um, so when I was reading Women Talking and then looking back at your corpus of work, it struck me that, two things struck me. One is that as a writer, contemporary writer, you in many ways embody a new a generation of people who have survived. You know, coming out of Mennonite cultures and the things that you talk about that need to be looked at more closely in that culture. But uh, very strangely, I also saw that there was a sort of uh, theme for me that was similar to Caribbean women's writing uh, because I, star I started seeing Mennonite people and people in Steinbeck because I'd grown up around Mennonite people, uh, you know, all my young life, uh, as, I as an island, you know, that we might think about Steinbeck as an island. And I wonder if you could begin our conversation by talking about the ways in which you've excavated and looked at that isolated culture and found ways to uh, expose it, but in, in very compassionate and loving ways. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's an interesting, I wish I had grown up in a Caribbean <laughs> island instead of, <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, that's, that's true. I mean, it is, the, my, my community, my Mennonite community is, is um, it's, it's a very homogenous, um, it's, it's, you know, the Mennonites have a history of persecution and have moved from place to place to place or have fled place to place to place, um, always um, remaining apart from the world, which is, you know, one of the sort of central tenets of the, of the faith and of the culture in the world, but not of the world. Uh, and, um, and in many ways exists, you know, these towns, these communities, these colonies do exist as islands, it's true. Uh, and um, certainly the, we, we weren't able to, to leave um, the you know kind of, kind of literally there were, there was no train going through town um, you know no bus service I mean we were expected to stay in 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 the community and to you know follow the rules of that community and and um, and so when I when I write about the community um, which I do frequently um, I mean I'm you know, and I, and I have said this so many times that I, that I, that I, I am critical of uh, that that culture of control. I'm critical of the, you know the authoritarianism, the fundamentalism, the patriarch, the higher the patriarchy, the hierarchy of it, the um, the silencing, the lack of agency for girls and women, um, the you know you know the rules uh, uh, and uh, and and that emphasis on punishment and guilt and and and, and then of course everything being you know, ordained by, by God, so there's no, um, there's no, you know, challenging it. Um, but, you know, but at the same time, um, you know, I have, I, I'm not critical of, of, of the faith uh, or, or of the people. And, and I've attempted in my work to show that these Mennonite people, which can be so easily thought of as kind of freaks, you know, sort of a kind of weird cult of freaks out in the middle of nowhere often doing their own thing collectively living in medieval ways you know with such such um rules strict rigid rigid rules and and um you know and the misogyny of course and the entitlement um within these within these communities and i wanted to show these people and i do want to show these people as, as human beings you know with rich inner lives with with um with humor with compassion with love you know that they embody we they embody all of these all of these things and so with women talking you know the challenge was that absolutely to show you know the 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 negative aspect of, of these communities and to try, attempt to answer some questions um, but also to show you know these these Mennonites as as real people like anybody else mm -hmm. so what's interesting with women talking is that you have a male narrator mm -hmm. August Epp Mm -hmm. And ostensibly, the protagonist appears to be Ona, a woman for whom he has unrequited love. Mm -hmm. And when I was reading the novel, I went back to Swing Low and a phrase in Swing Low, uh, which the question was, who takes care of a Mennonite woman? Uh, and so I wondered if you could talk a little bit about the narrative choice, mm -hmm. because as uh, Kim, uh, Professor Drake said at the beginning, this is a group of women who do not read or write, 
But Ona is the person who asks August to take notes mm -hmm. about the women debating about their choice, right? Mm -hmm. And the, mm -hmm. the three choices that they have are do nothing, stay and fight, or leave. And then Ona adds layers mm -hmm. to that as the discussion goes on. Mm -hmm. But Ona also is the keeper of memory for mm -hmm. this group, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and so I was interested in the ways in which even though August is narrating the story mm -hmm. and seems to be empowered to do so, he's empowered by Ona to mm -hmm. do so. Absolutely. And I won't give away the end of the novel for those who have yet mm -hmm. to read it, but, it be, but it's very clear that she has chosen and you have chosen August mm -hmm. for a very specific reason mm -hmm. that has to do with answering that question, mm -hmm. I think, mm -hmm. uh, who takes care of a Mennonite woman. Mm -hmm. Could you speak a little bit to those narrative choices? Yeah, I mean, August, you know... Um, August is um, the narrator for, for many reasons, just simply, practically, uh, the women in these colonies and in this colony are illiterate, they don't read and write, and so, you know, the, the whole, the content of, of the book is the, the minutes of, of, of these meetings that the women have, these urgent over a period of, you know, 48 hours of what, what they're going to do. And, and, um, and August, uh, you know, has his own sort of backstory and is in the colony, has returned to the colony. And Ona senses um, that he is, um, he's, he's despairing, he's suffering, he's suicidal. And, uh, and, and so she says, basically, um, as, as an act of compassion uh, and love, Genuine love for August, whether it's a romantic love or, or it's a, it's you know it's a, it's agape. It's this mm. this thing that I feel is the meaning of life. Um, a, a, a sense of compassion and, and love for for this person, and, and says, listen, listen, August. Just kind of randomly, she gives him this task. Why don't you come with us, women? We have work to do. We're meeting, uh, you know, in this loft, and you know, why don't you come with us and write it, write down what what we say? Um, you know, the women can't do it themselves, and so essentially, she's giving him this task mm -hmm. to keep him safe, so that as long as he's with the women in the loft, he'll be safe. Mm -hmm. And um, and then again, you know, the purpose of August as the narrator too is to sort of be the, you know, he he's there, he's there to to bear witness, mm -hmm. to to listen. Uh, and and to and to to document and to learn, and so in that sense, you know, think of him as kind of you know you know functioning as every man. But but you know, it's the, and it, it it's that that inverse too of, of traditional roles. The women are there right. to philosophize, to plan, to think, to plan, and to act. Uh, and 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 he is there, you know, as the secretary to take the notes and again to you know to to bear witness and 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 he's there basically to keep him safe. Uh, he's he's not really considered a man, right. a real man mm -hmm. within the context of this community. Uh, he's a teacher, mm -hmm. um, you know, an intellectual of sorts, and you know believes in reading and writing and education and, and reason. And for all these reasons, he's you know the 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 real men of the of the colony are suspicious of him, and uh, so he's not even invited to go with the men to right. to do you know the men's business and and. Um, uh, yeah, so I guess those are those are some of the. He, and he, you know, he kind of also inhabits this liminal space mm -hmm. between the, the, the closed uh, world of the colony and the outside world, which he has been living in for a number of years, and mm -hmm. and that I felt could add, you know, from time to time, you know, anecdotes or observations from the outside world adds a kind of a breather mm -hmm. to the the claustrophobic, you know. Uh, you know, uh, whatever of the uh, atmosphere of, of the loft. Yeah, it's interesting because at one point you describe Ona as being attacked repeatedly despite, quote, her thoughts and words perceived as meaningless. And it made me wonder then if clearly she's being attacked because she's perceived as a dangerous woman. Mm -hmm. uh, and that connects to a note that you have at the beginning of the novel where you say this is an act of female imagination. Mm -hmm. And so I wondered if you could comment a little bit about you know, these attacks in some ways being about uh, perceiving women as dangerous mm -hmm. uh, beyond the misogyny and the controlling of their mm -hmm. bodies, right? Mm -hmm. But being perceived as dangerous as female, as women. And then mm -hmm. what did you mean by an act of female imagination? Mm -hmm. Well, I was using it um, so, sort of as, a, as an echo of um, when, when these rapes 
occurred, and, and the rumors are that they're still happening, um, even mm, though yeah. the uh, the <coughs> perpetrators, the rapists, the, the alleged rapists, the rapists uh, are, are in prison in, in Bolivia. Um, maybe now they've been freed. I don't know mm. what's going on in Bolivia, but 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 um, the and 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 when the women started talking about what had happened to them, and it took a while. Mm -hmm for them to start talking about what had happened to them because they were waking up with, you know, knowing that they had been harmed in some way, uh, um, but not really understanding what, what had happened, of course. And when they started talking, um, you know, and to, amongst themselves, and then to the elders, to the men in the, in the colony saying, you know, we think this is happening. They were told, you know, no, you're crazy, of course. You know, you're, you're crazy, you're making it up. That's just your wild female imagination. Um, or, or you know, yeah, yeah, okay. So it happened, but it happened because you know, be, because the devil, the devil, the devil did it as punishment for some perceived sin, mm -hmm. whatever, whatever it is that you know they would put on them. And so, um, you know, so I just wanted to take that and and you know and and, and use it to you know as a, as an act of, of female imagination mm -hmm. that the book and that the meetings and that the book itself are. Is an act is an act of imagination, uh, you know. Hopefully, something that's healing or pr or productive. Um, but but um, also, yeah, the danger of women. I mean, and Ona is considered especially dangerous because, on the one hand, she too, like August, is dismissed um, as you, you, you know crazy, suffering from narfa nerves. She's not a she's not also she's not a real woman again within the context of this community. She she isn't married. She doesn't want to be married. She doesn't have children. Uh, and um, she has been kind of dismissed as, as, a, as a crazy sort of weird nonsense, you know, useless, uh, useless person, uh, kind of as a non-person, a, a ghost, you know. But because of that, for her, it suits her in a way. Mm -hmm. she, feel, she feels free as a result if she's not going to be policed in every way, you know, um, her body, her mind, her soul, her spirit, as, as the women are in these colonies, you know, then, and if she's just ignored and dismissed, then she's free. And of course, you know, for her to think of herself as having freedom, well, that's a very dangerous position mm -hmm. for, for the, you know, that, that the men find her um, to be a dangerous individual. And then, and then I think that is, you know, that, that's the context for, you know, outside of these colonies as well, wherever we are. I mean, you know, for certain men, this idea that we're free, suddenly that we're empowered, um, that women are, have, have a voice or have some control is dangerous. I didn't know until I started, until I wrote this book and published this book, um, how, how threatened uh, people are, and I suppose most, mo mostly men um, are, by, and not all men, by a group of women talking, mm. you know? I mean, this book in particular, and a lot of books that I've written have upset, of course, the Mennonite, you know, elders, the religious male elders, but, but um, this, this book in particular, like, there was a lot of um, So anger. within the Mennonite culture, or yeah. also without the very... Within the Mennonite culture. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, interesting. Because I, I remember coming to the launch and seeing that there were a lot of Mennonite people, mostly yeah. women, yeah. Uh, and <laughs> yeah. multi-generations in attendance. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I thought that I was, I was struck by that, you mm -hmm. know, the visibility. Mm -hmm. um, but that is interesting. Could you speak a little bit more about, because that connects another question I have, mm -hmm. which is a theme that I see threading through your work, and I know you've talked about, which, and you mentioned just earlier, fundamentalism, right? Mm -hmm. That, uh, of course, people could read your work and be dismissive and say it's only about, you know, uh, primarily Mennonite culture, but I think the reason it's been celebrated and read so widely mm -hmm. is because it speaks to people outside of Mennonite mm -hmm. culture and to women in particular mm -hmm. who may be experiencing similar kinds of things. But it's not just women, mm -hmm. uh, because it's clear throughout your work that you're also pointing out how the fundamentalism harms men, Absolutely. right? Um, so could you speak a little bit about that concern? And is it something that has developed more over time that you're more clearly defining in your work? Or is, has it always been uh, part of your intent to sort of attack you know, the ways in which different kinds of fundamentalism mm -hmm. are, some, are something we should all be concerned about. Mm -hmm. and, and it actually has struck me, it struck me preparing for today uh, that Bolivia is going through all this upheaval mm -hmm. right now. Mm -hmm. uh, and the person who, the coup that has just occurred and ousted, yeah. you know, uh, that head of state, uh, yeah. you know, that person now went to the, to the state house with a Bible and the flag and said they were going to, you know, reconstitute 
the state, uh, you know, sort of dismantle the socialist state yeah. and put back in a sort of uh, Bible-driven or Christian-driven ideology of, of con a conservative yeah. uh, regime. Um, so, it's, so it's ironic, uh, you know, in, in terms of what's happening now, yeah. that your book is set in Bolivia and it's about a fundamentalism with, you know, imported from without, but there's fundamentalism all, yeah. all around, yeah. even at the time this was going on. I mean, I think, um, just to answer the, yeah, the earlier part yeah. of that, that I, th I think that it is something that it's only later. It's, it, you know, the longer I live, uh, you know, I, 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 um, two, two things happen, sort of opposites, is that, is that I'm angrier um, and uh, more aware of um, the harm that this fundamentalism mm -hmm. does, and, and particularly uh, to to women, but also to men, uh, absolutely. Um, that dehumanization um, that occurs. Um, I, 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 but I, but I'm, but I'm also, I also am feeling more. Um, I don't know, forgiving, mm -hmm. loving. I, I, I don't. I'm, I'm not forgiving. I mean, forgiveness is a religious concept that I don't really believe in. I think it's more important to just understand the root causes of these types of things and then attempt to change, to change, to change those the, the root causes for these types of attacks, rapes, whatever it is, injustice. Um, but fundamentalism, certainly. I mean, the 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 destruction. I mean, the harm that uh, you know on so many levels. Um, that I've seen in my community, um, and then particularly, you know, when, when you're when you're translating the scripture literally, and and it says, "Women submit to your husbands, children submit to your fathers," and then the people who are preaching this use this in a, in a in a way. Um, I mean, you can imagine you, you you see how you know to their benefit. You see how these types of attacks can occur. So when when Mennonites heard about what was happening in Bolivia on this colony, nobody was surprised. Mm -hmm. Nobody. No Mennonite. Knowing at least Mennonites have, who have grew, grew up in conservative communities were surprised. Um, horrified, yes, but, but, um, but not surprised. And, mm -hmm. you know, and, and in terms of the, the situation in Bolivia now, too, um, you know, I, I think the first Mennonites in, Bo in Bolivia went in the 50s. They were a, a sort of splinter group from my community in, in Manitoba to Mexico to Paraguay to Bolivia. Belize, etc., but the ones in Bolivia would have been, I think, welcomed by that um, right. more, more right the Christian, you know, mm -hmm. by, like by, by that government, and mm -hmm. very likely, although I wouldn't want to, you know, um, but w would be quite happy with this, you mm -hmm. know, um, U.S. Um, sponsored or controlled coup, mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and um, yeah, um, who and and would hope that you know the country, yeah, would 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 go back to its, you know, to it. To that, to that, you know, that kind of regime, in, in a sense. Um, so my follow-up would be yeah. <laughs> uh, that women talking is about giving w women a voice, right? Who mm -hmm. have been in these repressed sort of situations. One of the things I've noticed throughout your writing is the humor that mm -hmm. you use. So even as these women are gathering to talk about a very difficult situation, mm -hmm. are afraid of the men returning and being found, and mm -hmm. uh, what will happen, especially if they stay, mm -hmm. uh, or what will happen if they stay and the men are, are prosecuted, right? Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that, that has struck me in your writing is that you have sort of unconventional ways of uh, providing not exactly solutions, but a kind of way to think through these difficulties. Mm -hmm. Humor is one of them. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, and then in a complicated kindness, and I think maybe this is where the title came from, is the idea that individuals in a family might make the choice, for example, in that novel, of, of leaving the family mm -hmm. in order for their best hope, you know, the youngest person of the family to have a chance, right, mm -hmm. rather than be shunned or have that child shunned mm -hmm. the way the community, the culture would. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm wondering, you know, it seems like you're offering that as, as signs of hope. Mm -hmm. And so I'm wondering where do you think hope resides in these kinds of situations? Yeah, well, I don't, I don't know, but I mean, we, we have to have hope. I mean, I have to have hope. And, yeah. and, and, and I feel that, you know, even though it seems so hopeless, to, to, to even imagine change, you know, in, the, in these communities, to imagine, um, you know, a, a type of, mm, 
overthrowing of this system or, 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 or a consolidated resistance to it and then change into, you know, because I mean, it's, it's very difficult to just waltz into a community like this. Uh, you know, this is a, that's a very paternalistic thing to go into a community like this and say, you know, you, you can't do this, you're backward, you're, this is abusive, you, you, you know, you need to change your ways and live differently. I mean, everybody has the right to practice mm -hmm. their, their religion, you know, which doesn't, of course, give you the right to, you know, to drug and attack women. But, but um, so it's, it's so, you know, and there, and there are aspects of these communities that, you know, are genuinely, I mean, you know, kind of, uh, you know, positive. In in a sense, um, you know, but 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 um, so, but then to think, uh, you know, how can I mean, you know, the conservativism within these communities is getting more and more entrenched. I mean, there's there's a real separation, uh, you know, the spiritual the the spirituality, you know, that was there at the beginning uh, with the Mennonites and the and this this conviction, you know, and this is how we're going to live and this is what we need to do and we're going to you know, live according to, you know, God's, um, the, you know, teach the, the scripture, et cetera, um, and collectively uh, as pacifists. I mean, so much of that has been lost, you know, that, that kind of, the, the sort of moral way, mm -hmm. the moral compass and the spirituality has been lost and it's just mm -hmm. de de devolved into just rules and punishment and shunning and and, 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 you know, and it's, and, and so in, in a sense, I mean, you know, the, the, the world, I think we still think, oh, these are religious communities doing their thing, but, you know, really none, none of that is, is, it's not really happening, particularly, you know, in the ultra conservative colonies in, in Bolivia. Mm -hmm. uh, and, um, and so, you know, but so to hope for a change, of course, I mean, of course we have to live with hope, of course, right. of course, of course. And the humor, I mean, the humor, the use of humor, it's not something that I consciously do. It's just, you know, again, you know, I probably rambled about something like that in the film. But, uh, <laughs> you, you know, it's just, it's another, it's another, it's the way I see the world. But, but, but it's also, and it's not a, it's not a, a respite, you know, humor within the, within the narrative. It's not a, it's not supposed to be a breather or mm -hmm. a chance to look away. Mm from the dark stuff, you know, it's just another way, like you say, of looking at it, mm -hmm. you know, and, and of course, within the Mennonite community, and I'm sure other fundamentalist communities, other authoritarian communities, there's, there's such a degree of subversive humor, and particularly with the women, you know, the women that I remember having spent, you know, my, you know, growing up in, in my Mennonite community, the, the, the men and the women were separated most of the time, um, you know, doing different things, different, you know, roles to play. And, uh, and so that subversive humor that I remember from, you know, all of my, my aunts and mother and grandmother and, um, you know, a little the, the sort of throwing stones at the castle wall kind of thing, always, but, but the, and then pulling back, like always kind of knowing when to stop. Um, yeah. I didn't know when to stop and was excommunicated <laughs> as a result. <laughs> uh, but, but, you know, those who were more savvy, who wanted to remain in the community, knew where, knew where, knew where to stop. Um, and I think, too, the laughter in the book, you know, the laughter that I remember from these Mennonites, and still do. My mother still lives with me, and Mennonites are always coming to our house, and, they're, and you know, religious Mennonites as well, because my mother is one. Um, you know, and the singing and the laughter and the laughter. And I think of the laughter often as uh, words mm -hmm. that just, that, 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 that aren't, you know, articulated as words, but that are, that the, the laughter is, that are the sort of words at the end of the sentence that is begun mm -hmm. or the thought that is just initially kind of just, you know, touched on and then the laughter and everybody will join in the laughter in that kind of knowing, like a chorus, you know, that it's not just sound and breath. It's there's a lot of meaning in the laughter, words mm. in the laughter. So it's, it's expressive. So it's, yeah. it's its own language in a way. Yeah. Uh, it actually made me think of, of uh, a line in women talking. I think uh, I think Ona says this. 
uh, when we have liberated ourselves, we will have to ask ourselves who we are. And it seems like somehow the laughter is a part of that. You mm -hmm. know, that there are ways in which you were bringing in the who we are. But that sentence also struck me as very Edwardian. You know, it made me think mm -hmm. of some of uh, Margaret Atwood's work yeah. in terms of, you know, we need to look at ourselves and really understand, you know, yeah. what it is that we're doing, you know? Yeah. Um, so another question I have for you has, with, with women talking in particular, it's one of the few books that isn't really autobiographically mm -hmm. drawn mm -hmm. uh, in your corpus of work so far. Uh, but you have said in past, in recent interviews, mm -hmm. that it could have been you. And I did notice that one of the family names is one of your family names. They're both, right? both. Um, oh, both the of them. the Fre Friesen is my is my um, my grand my maternal grandmother's okay. maiden name, and Lowen is my mother's maiden name. Oh, how interesting. Okay, yeah. so I missed the Friesen part. <laughs> uh, so, but I thought, is this was this a way to draw yourself into the story, or to make the comment for the reader? Uh, if they were to pick up on something like this, mm -hmm. that, uh, you know, situations like this could happen to any mm -hmm. one of us, right, mm -hmm. depending on where you're born or mm -hmm. where you're raised. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think all of these things are, in some way, are accidents of fate, but mm -hmm. in other ways, there are also things that are all around us. Yeah. And so I wondered if that was a way for you to negotiate it, not being about you, but that it mm -hmm. could have been. Absolutely. And also, just in terms of um, creating the characters, I created each of the, I sort of fashioned each of the characters after, uh, you know, the, the Mennonite women that I know, my family and friends, and, um, and in that way, you know, I could, I could sort of, you know, apply, you know, certain char characteristics and, and um, traits uh, on them. So, you know, the challenge was to sort of keep the voices distinct and keep the character, characters distinct, even though they are a collective community and they are speaking as a chorus in, in, in many ways, trying to figure out as a group what they're going to do. Uh, together, but but um, yeah. So for me, it was easier to, to you know to, to think of them as as the people that I know and and um, you know yeah and, and those personalities and, and uh, but yeah, but absolutely. I mean, you know, the the hope I guess that with with any you know fiction, mm -hmm. so called fiction or writing, is that it transcends you know the the sort of the confines. Uh, you know the borders of its own, and and, and um, you know and can and can be seen as a, as a universal thing. And certainly, I think you know we 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 would all agree that you know we're the the conditions or the circumstances of these colonies um, are are um, uh, the conditions that we are all living in in one way or another. And we're all we're all having to make these decisions. Mm -hmm. What, what we're going to, you know, whether it's in, in, at home, in a relationship, in a job, it's, you know, whatever it is, like, what are we going to do? How are we going to deal with this? Do we, um, you know, do, do, do we stay and fight? Mm -hmm. Do we leave, you know, or do we do nothing? Mm -hmm. And I think that most of us are grappling with those types of questions all the time. Yeah, could you connect that maybe to, to, to some uh, statements that you've made about cultures of denial uh, and mental health or mental illness or mental wellness? Uh, I mean, we're on a college campus. Uh, we often have conversations about maintaining wellness you know, with, with uh, college age students. Uh, suicide is the second highest uh, you know, reason for death in, the, in this age group. And it is something we have to struggle with as a community. And so I wondered if that if something you could speak to about that in terms of how do we work at looking at ourselves and cultures of denial and then creating more healing or healthier spaces for everyone. Yeah, I mean, that's such a huge, a huge question. question. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, you know, the, the, the health and, and well-being, um, both my father and my sister committed suicide and, and suffered deeply, deeply for most of their lives. And... Um, with mental illness, and um, you know, the, the you know the loneliness of it, mm. well, um, and the fight, the struggle, like the endless struggle. I mean, I remember, you know, my sister at one point after several attempts, you know, I said to her, "Okay, now, you know, now you have to fight. You have to fight." And you know, she looked at me and said, "You know, Miriam, I've been fighting for 40 years," and I was so struck by that. And I realized, and I, and I, you know, and it's, um, 
and why, you know, it's, 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 it's just so lonely, it's so difficult, and that is because of the stigma that's attached to it. That is because, you know, it's a fearful, it's a terrifying thing to think that any one of us could just suddenly become mentally ill, could, you know, in effect, lose our minds, could lose ourselves, could, uh, could kill ourselves. I mean, we don't want to think about that. We don't want to think about the people that we love killing themselves, about the, the possibility that we might kill our, you know, the horror of that, and, and the the violence of that, and 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 um, you know, and so it's easier, of course, to just deny it, to say, well, that is dark stuff. Okay, we know that suicide exists; it always has, it always will. But we we don't have to think about that. That's ugly. It's violent. Um, you know, let's just put that there in the dark where where it belongs. And of course, you know, that doesn't do a thing to change. It. And then, you know, you know, funding. I mean, mm -hmm. research. You know, um, money <laughs> put towards research and towards care and towards an understanding and towards you know just reducing the stigma, destroying the stigma. Um, uh, you know, it's just. I mean, it's it's a huge, huge mm -hmm. task, but. But I, I feel I agree with you that you know one thing we can do, at, at least, is is stop denying you know right. the, the reality of it. And the other part would seem to be listening, which is actually at the heart of women talking. As you were talking about the narrator and his function, right? He's writing down the story, but he's also listening. And he's from that group that normally is, you know, empowered. He's disempowered, as you've explained, within this community. But he does. He is male, and he has more power structurally. Yeah. And the fact that he listens is really instrumental. Yeah. Um, other places that I've noticed in some of your interviews, you've also said the importance of a, of a one other, you know, the friend, mm -hmm. right? The importance mm -hmm. in uh, communities where people feel isolated mm -hmm. to find the one friend, whoever that might be. And it seems that the relationship with August and Ona yeah. is about that one friend. And yeah. I think it, in each of your works, there is yeah. this kind of coupling, you know, one mm -hmm. person with another and yeah. that making a difference, yeah. you know, for them. Yeah. Um, so I don't, that's not yeah. a really a question, yeah. but it's an yeah. observation. <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, so more largely speaking, could you say something to, you know, your role, how you see your role as a writer, uh, you know, in terms of creating bridges of compassion, of empathy, uh, and what advice you would for writers, mm -hmm. you know, young or older in the audience mm -hmm. uh, about, you know, the, the writing life or, mm -hmm. you know, doing this kind of work, which I know is difficult work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, um, you know, we had an interesting discussion earlier you know, that idea of, of self-preservation, you know, um, writing. I mean, you know, and it, I mean, I, I, fee, I feel that a writer will write if you, if, you know, if you, if you need to write to make sense of the world, which I do, um, you know, in order to, to stay healthy, mentally healthy, uh, to, to, cr to craft narrative, to impose a type of order on my thoughts and feelings and, you know, within narrative mm -hmm. writing. It, it, it's an absolute need for me, um, you, you know, and I, and I feel that if you have that, you know, then you need to honor that and you need to take it seriously and, um, and, and to write as honestly and intelligently as you can, again, which I was saying, and then that sounds so simplistic, but it's a, it is that mantra that keeps going through, you know, through my head and, and that, you know, with every... Again, I'm, I'm, you know, saying something that I've said before. But with every, you know, there, are, with every occupation, you know, there, there are risks, and, and writing is, is no exception. Um, you know, hazards, and and um, and and to put yourself out there and to really go deep within yourself and to bring it out is incredibly liberating. When you realize that others are feeling like you, and you're having a conversation with others, even if you never meet them. Um, you know, even if it's just one or two or twenty or a hundred, whatever it is, you know, however, and you know that you know you're you're having a conversation and you're less alone, um, and that's the beginning of something radical, in my opinion, storytelling, and um, and that kind of uh, solidarity and 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 um, you know, and if that's something, you know, I think it's just it's a need for some people, and and it, it must be honored because maybe it's a an obligation. As, as well. Um, I certainly feel that. Mm. 
an occupation of preoccupation. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so I want to ask a final question before I open it up to the audience. Uh, and we are co-sponsored by our Women and Gender Studies uh, program. So I want to ask a, a gender-specific question, and also because we're at Scripps and it's a women's college, uh, because some of the audience members may not know you've had many lives. I know you've had many <laughs> lives. Uh, you know, you're a mother, you're a grandmother, uh, you're a film studies major. Uh, you have another degree as well in journalism. Um, yeah, just film studies journalism. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I know your first novel was about your experience being on welfare as a young mm -hmm. person. Um, you also, if correct me if I'm wrong, you were also nominated for Best Actress for the Mexico Awards, right. Film Awards, yep. because you starred in a film that then inspired one of your novels, Irma yeah. Vov. Uh, so you've had many, many lives, yeah. and uh, as I was inviting you here, I was thinking it would be great if you could say something to our audience, especially the young women in the audience, about uh, the importance of being able to have the kind, I, I see you as a woman of courage mm. who has done many things and mm. not allowed anything that might be perceived as failure to sort of get in your way. And so I would love for you to, I'd like to end mm. with this question, which mm. is really what advice would you give young women who are just finding their way mm. about just being open to what life brings? Oh. <laughs> That's a big question. <laughs> I mean, to fail, to feel free to fail. Mm. And, I, and I, I suppose I would need to credit my own mother and father, mm -hmm. my parents, for, for you know, instilling that in me, that I can attempt something and fail, which I have done many, 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 many times. Maybe that's why I've done so many different things. Is it? Um, but, but um, you know, and that, and that, that you know, has uh, uh, nothing to do with anything that we can, that we can try and we can fail and as Samuel Beckett, whoever it was, yeah, we can better. fail better, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, try, try again, fail, fail better. Um, uh, you know, advice, I mean, to be what, it, my, my father who, and again, sometimes when, you know, when you distill this stuff, you come down to these things that sound like such cliches, but they're kind of real and true for a reason. And my father who suffered so much who felt the expectations of his community as a devout Mennonite man, um, you know, in such, and who struggled and struggled, you know, and, and, and you know, and, um, and, and was abused as a, as a child and was expected to, to be this and that and, 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 and a good Christian on top of everything and sort of keep his illness a secret he tried to I mean everybody knew that he was that he suffered he was he was diagnosed with uh, was called then manic, manic depression bipolar disorder um, you know he told me um, one one time the only advice that he ever ever gave me um, you know I, I and I and the context was I was I was a teenager and I was talking about something that I thought would be great that I that I would like what I would like to do and you know and and he said you know be he, he I said well what do you think and he and he said it you know it doesn't really matter what I think which was his always his self-deprecating way but he, he said just be yourself and that's not necessarily an easy thing to do, and it is so tremendously important. And by being oneself, we do often fail if we're attempting to do the things that we want to do, if we're attempting to say the things that we need to say, to experience the things in life that we want to experience, you know, to, to love the people that we want to love and be loved in the way that we want and need to be loved. Um, you know, and I'm not, again, not just talking about a romantic relationship, but, but in the world. You know, um, to be oneself, it, it, you know, was the best advice that, that I that I ever received. And then to know that I that I was supported and 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 loved, and I, and I could and I could fail, um, and I and I could and I could um, continue. I, you know, it, it, it's it's not. You know, I don't know exactly um, what else what else what else to say. Um, and it, it's not so much about being. I don't think of myself as courageous mm -hmm. or brave. You know, I really do think of just doing the thing that I want and need to do. And, and um, you know, 
assuming that that doesn't cause harm to others. <laughs> um, well, maybe we can redefine the terms in the same way that in Women Talking you redefine the roles, you know, yeah. that listening becomes important. Uh, and I would say that courage is about being able to be yourself to the full mm. capacity, mm. which is, as you're saying, very difficult to do. Mm. Um, we'd like to open it up to questions from the floor at this point. We have about 10, 12 minutes. Um, we have two mics that are going to run. We are recording everything, so we would like to, to see hands up clearly, and then the two young ladies who are in the middle will run the mics to you. I see a hand here, I see a hand over here. There's a hand right in front of you, right here. There's a hand right here. Right, oh. Hi. Hi. Um, uh, we're recording, so I'm, I apologize. Oh. Just make sure it's on. There you go. Hello. Oh, there we Thank go. You. I'm, I'm curious what your favorite thing about growing up in the community was. What? Oh, that's it. I like that. What, what was my favorite thing about growing up in my community? My favorite thing was the freedom, the intense freedom that I had as a kid. Um, when I was a kid, um, you know, it was a kid, for me. Uh, it was it was kind of I idyllic. Everybody knew who I was, who my grandparents were, who my parents were, my great grandparents. You know where where we we were, we all came from the same place. We were all related. My parents were second cousins. <laughs> um, that's how that works in these communities. <laughs> and and um, you know I could go from house. I mean, as a young kid, four or five, I could roam around. Um, go from house to house, knock on any door, and I'd, you know, come on in, here's a cookie, here's a Bible verse <laughs> that they would lay on, like, you know, I get, you know, it was worth it just to get the cookie, I could, okay, you know, you know, and just move around like that, just the freedom of being, you know, and then, you know, I mean, that changed as I became a teenager, I started to, you know, understand, sort of, and, and see kind of what, what was going on, but, uh, but yeah, it was that freedom of, of movement and, and feeling just known, just abs absolute, you know, absolutely at ease within the entire, entire community. And I, I was lucky. Mm -hmm. There's a question in the middle, then we'll come back here. Thank you so much for sharing. Uh, quick question. Can you describe your publishing process a little bit, uh, the role of the editor, and then also how you got initially hooked up with your literary agent? Uh, the role of my editor and what with the literary agent? Uh, just how you met your literary agent for the first time and how that works. Like, oh, are you still in contact? How, how, how did I find? Yes. Yeah, okay, sorry. <laughs> I'm, I'm getting deaf and blind. I'm a grandma. <laughs> uh, um, my, with, uh, uh, you know, for me, I find the editing process so painful, so tedious, and uh, so, you know, I have a kind of maybe impatient personality, you know, I figure, okay, I'm done, that's it, what? You know, now we have to work on it again forever and ever and ever and draft after draft and, and I just, but I'm obsessive about it too, I'll lie awake at night, you know, worrying about, oh, you know, she's suggesting that I change, you know, that I do this or that, and no, and I'll change it back, and I'll, and I'm notorious, too, in the editing process. My publisher will say, okay, that's it. Now there's no more time. Okay, this is, this is, this is, this is it. And, uh, and I, but I know that's not true. I know they're lying to me because they know <laughs> that, <laughs> and that I still have, you know, another week or whatever it is, but like, or two weeks even, you know, before the thing's going to go to the pr the. Pr printer or whatever. And so, you know, because just up until the last second, I'm thinking, no, take out that comma from there, because of course that changes the breath and the reading and the pacing. And the, and all of that is important, you know, and, and um, yeah, it's just, and you know, if you change one thing here, then you have to go through the whole thing and change it there to make it. And it's so painful. It's like math or something, you know, like, well, it's an equation. Okay. The, and uh, yeah, so I just, I just find editing to be like, oh, you know, I can barely, and when I get it back with every single page m marked with red, every single page <laughs> marked up, every, like almost every sentence, you know, you just, your heart sinks. You thought, I thought, oh, I thought I was done, but, and that it was good. You guys want to publish it, but now you have all these problems with, you know. <laughs> anyway, that's editing, <laughs> and it's necessary. Thank God for editors. <laughs> 
um, and uh, you know, it's such a relationship of faith and trust. And you know, a good editor, you know, say, saves us from ourselves. <laughs> and um, and, and uh, my agent, um, yeah, sh uh, yeah. I like. I not everybody has an agent, but I I have an agent, and I'm very happy uh, with my agent. And um, you know, all all of that stuff, like. Just, just all of all of the contracts and all of that negotiating, and you know, like I, I just wouldn't be able to do that. Um, but you started out with small presses. Yeah, I and started out without an agent. I started out, when I started out. I, I didn't have an agent, and it's it's hard to get an agent, you know, especially when you're starting out. And I sent it to I sent my first manuscript to about six or seven small presses across the country, Canada, um, sort of, and, and then I heard back from. Two of those six that I sent it to actually were interested in publishing it, and then I chose the the publisher, the Turnstone Press, which was the the small independent local press in Winnipeg, where I'm from, uh, where I was living, and and um, yeah, and then after that I got an agent, and yeah. And the rest is history. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, there was a question right here. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, here we are on campus, and we've seen in the last um, recent history, at least, of forces of identity politics, of multiculturalism, these kinds of things uh, making themselves felt. Have you had them impact uh, your writing process, or are you are you able to go forward with your themes without uh, concerning that too much? I mean, it's always, yeah, like it's a, it's something that I think about a lot more now too, like everybody, I, I, I think, you know, in terms of identity and, 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 and gender and, and, um, uh, I've, and, and, and it's not, I don't think that it, I mean, but no, it's, I was, I mean, I was thinking about things like that, you know, particularly with my male narrator you know the, the and 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 I did receive a lot of flack like wow you know this book that's called women talking how could you you know a lot of you know some women would say you know how could you have a male narrator uh, and um, you know and and I I always felt I always knew that you know it, that was something that I felt strongly about for the reasons that I mentioned earlier why that sort of inversion of things and and um, and just because of the you know the, the circumstances of the uh, of the colony and the illiteracy of the women, and that it was minutes, et cetera, et cetera. But I did think about that, and I am thinking about that more, absolutely, um, with my work. And I think the you know all of the writers that I that I know, um, we're we're all we're all thinking about that a lot a lot more. Um, we have been made to think about that a lot more, and we want to think about that a lot more. Um, and it's important. Um, you know, I'm not. A, I'm not a. I'm not a sp spokesperson. I don't. I don't know how to talk about it uh, well, as you can see. <laughs> but but um, it is something that if, that that I do think about way more now, and 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 as it applies to my writing. Yeah. The question here. We have time for about two more questions. I think. Hi. Thank Hi. you so much for coming. Um, I was wondering whether all the different lives that you've lived and your exposure to journalism and film studies and your background as an actress, um, whether all of those or any of those have influenced your writing in any way, uh, positive or negative? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I think everything that I've done is, you know, I, I, and when I started out writing obviously autobiographical fiction, um, people then, you know, there was that, you know, the t this, oh, well, you know, that's a sort of, that's, that, you know, women, women's kind of, women write autobiographically or, or these small domestic stories of, you know, women and children and, you know, <laughs> uh, you know, and is it really, I remember my first book, you know, some male, radio guys that, you know, is it even really a novel? Um, you know, this story about like women and children and welfare. I mean, what, who cares, who cares, you know? And, and, um, and, and, I, and I've always, and I, and I think that everything that, 
that I experience, I just take it. And again, it's just because I have that need to do that. Um, and again, you know, the hope is that I can, you know, also create something artful that people will want to read. But it really is a personal need to take the things that I experience and feel and think, and and um, you know, um, create create fiction uh, from them. And um, so, yeah, absolutely everything af affects me. And 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 I and I hope and I tend to use it too as a kind of way of getting through things like difficult things, too. You know, I think okay, well, you know, I can I, I will be able to process this in some way. I will be able to make some sense of this senseless thing in in some way. Um, you know, in my in my work, and even in, even in the act of writing, even if nobody ever reads it, you know, just the act of writing too. Um, you know, notebooks and notebooks and notebooks and notebooks. Sometimes I get so blocked and so down and discouraged and, and everything seems so impossible. And then I think, Miriam, just do, just do what you do. Just write something down. Just open up your notebook and just write what you just did. You know, I just took a, you know, pickle out of the fridge and, you know, <laughs> put it on a cracker. And, I, and just that act of, like, just that, you know, seems to give something, give some life in my mind, to me, like, it fills me up and makes me feel alive, yeah. We have a couple more questions here. There's also one in the back. Take two more. <laughs> um, just recently, I went to Michigan for a funeral, and our family is in an area where there is the very small a community of Mennonites, and so, um, I feel like it's very romanticized these yeah. days. I know people say, oh, we should live like that, we should, and so I'm curious uh, what you're feeling about what you're seeing these days, because now I understand this story was based on something that happened in Bolivia. So I was, when we were reading, our book club was reading it, we thought, I thought it was more of American, and so something that happened here. So your feelings, what do you feel about, uh, okay, so when I went to the funeral, my cousin who had passed away, her her house was full of, we found out, 200 Amish Mennonite novels. And so it's very romanticized, you know, and, and yet around the corner are the Mennonites and I went shopping there and picking their gourds and looking, thinking what a wonderful life and how sweet and kind and loving everyone is. But yet when the man talked about his wife, it's, he did talk almost like ownership of you know, she is the best um, baker in the area, but this one does the best honey and stuff like that. So I'm curious, yeah. Yeah. what do you feel when you see that? Or and have you, are you back in that area? Do you see this? This is real. It actually still living, people living like that. So yeah. um, what's your feelings about that today in this day and age? Yeah, I mean, there is that, that romanticization of it. Romanticization, romanticization, mm -hmm. is that the word? That's right. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I just seems so many syllables in there. Uh, and... Um, um, you know, this idea of intentional communities and, you know, we know what the world is like. The world is so filled with, you know, that the idea of like, let's just get away from it all and create our own little idyllic society where we'll share the work and we'll share the resources and we'll take care of each other. And of course that sounds beautiful and maybe it works somewhere, um, but in for a while maybe, but it seems as though this, it always kind of falls apart. I mean, that hierarchy, the power, um, you know, plays come into, uh, and um, you know, the, the, the Mennonite idea of living apart from the world. I mean, I, you know, the world, I mean, I longed for the world growing up, everything about, and, um, the fear that that breeds and, and the, the narrow-mindedness, um, not, not to mention the abuse, I mean, the, the levels of, of, of incest, of domestic abuse, domestic violence, sexual violence within these communities is so, so high. Um, uh, I mean, Mennonites from these colonies, the, con the ultra-conservative colonies, are able to get, ha get asylum in Canada often as refugees um, because of the circumstances of these colonies. Um, and, 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 you know, and for, so, so when people romanticize these, these places, yeah, I just, I, I just 
you know, want, want to shake them and say, look, but, you know, this, this is the reality. And, and in Toronto, where I, where I live, I mean, all the fancy restaurants, you know, it's always, okay, we have Mennonite eggs and Mennonite chickens, whatever that is. That sounds strange. But, you know, it's the Catholic chickens. I don't, I don't know. But anyway, um, but, you know, Mennonite raised and, and, and they're considered to be, you know, organic and, you know, pure, pure in some way. And Mennonite furniture for sale, you know, oh, it's going to be better made, you know, this, this, these sorts of ideas, um, you know, and, and um, yeah, and just the idea of living collectively and the alienation that we all experience in this world and in this life and the loneliness and uh, pressures, you know, to to make a living, and to you, you know, it's 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 easy to to extrapolate from that and to th and think, yeah, these communities do seem, you know, kind of great in in so many ways. But um. well, in some ways, your literature serves as a, as a demystification, right, mm -hmm. of Mennonite life. At the yeah. same time, as it opens it up to a larger conversation yeah. about who we are as yeah. as human beings and in communities. Yeah. Um, we've run out of time, so I want to thank everyone for coming, and I yeah, want us to thank, thank Miriam Tebbs for being here.